Welcome to the inaugural, the kickoff edition of Tasting Room After Hours. Uh, you know the Tasting Room podcast that is every Monday, live streamed 8 to 9 o'clock on YouTube and Instagram, and then posted as a podcast on Tuesday. So normally we try to get guests to come on that if they can, but sometimes schedules just don't line up. Kat Cox was one of those. She is too busy with Country Bird Bakery, which is the most popular bakery, probably in the state of Oklahoma. Um <laughs> The line that you see, if you've ever, if you don't know where it is, just think of the line that you've seen at 3rd and Utica on Saturday mornings that usually goes around the corner uh, of Oak Heart Barbecue. It's it's something to see. Kat, congratulations on all the success. Thank you for coming on. Um, oh, thank you. you. You had Thursday. So we're, we're recording this on a Thursday. I'll post it tomorrow on Friday. But you were open today. How often and what makes you decide if you're going to just do Saturday or do Thursday and Saturday? So we've been trying to do every other Thursday uh, when we can. Um, this kind of uh, November and December, the schedule got a little uh, discombobulated because of the holidays. Um, but yeah, we we try and do every other Thursday um, when we feel like we have the energy and the space in our production schedule. Um, and it's mostly... Uh, just about the fact that we are really tiny. Um, we have very uh, limited space. Um, we're a very small team. And so we uh, try and make uh, as much as we can, um, the best that we can make it. And um, so it's just, it's we're small and we are we open our doors as much as we can. And uh, that is a lot less than most uh, bakeries you would go to. <laughs> sure. Small yet mighty. Uh, Prudence yes. has smelled all of your baked goods in my house, so she had to get involved in the podcast, <laughs> apparently. She just wanted to uh, jump in my lap. My um, dog may uh, make a cameo as well. Yeah, we'll it, it happens pretty much every live stream. Uh, she's gotten <laughs> used to the Monday night. She usually just sleeps, but Charlie doesn't give a shit. He's over there just... <laughs> <laughs> laying down um so let's go back to the beginning your infatuation and love and passion for baking came from where um i started baking when i was like elementary school aged i think my mom had this betty crocker cookbook that was more of it was like a binder this bright orange three ring binder and she would let me make whatever i wanted to out of it which usually mm. meant a cake uh sometimes bread pretzels um, so I, it was just kind of a creative outlet and, um, yeah, she just kind of let me run with it. Um, and then I did not go to culinary school. I went to art school and, um, at that point baking was a hobby. Like I liked to bake for friends and for gatherings. Um, and then after college, I worked in New York in like the art scene uh and we my friends and i would get to their, get, get together and make like a bunch of pies for um our art openings um and then i just kind of got burnt out on living in the big city and mm -hmm. kind of uh a little jaded by like the posturing like in the art world and there was the economic collapse uh, and then I just decided to move to the desert. So I moved. I love that. To, I moved to Marfa. And uh, that's I didn't know that. You actually moved to Marfa. I You're like one of what, eight people that live in Marfa? Yeah. It was actually, <laughs> I think it was like just shy of 2,000 people uh, that's in incredible. that town. Yeah. Um, and that's where I started. I got it. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, so I got a job in a kitchen. And. Um, as a prep cook, because most of the prep stuff was a lot of baking. And then I very quickly kind of like accidentally worked my way up uh, into like a chef de cuisine position and was like running that kitchen. Um, and then I, I did that for a few years and I decided to move back to Tulsa where I grew up um, and uh, started. Uh, I worked at the farm when it was like just. Fridays and Saturdays, like maybe six months a year, I think. And mm. um, just kind of uh, really fell in love with making sourdough bread um, while I was, yeah, at the farm. 
That's incredible. Um, when you were doing art, what was your chosen like style of art? What did you I'm like a to do? I'm a paper maker. So um, I, uh, my um, major was textiles, fiber. And um, so we, the studio that I worked at was really cool. We collaborated with artists in the handmade paper medium. Um, so paper can be more than a substrate like for images to go on. You can actually create imagery in um, pulp. And I mean, it was really cool. I got to work with some really incredible artists and um, some of the paper that I made for like more well, like more established artists like Louise Bourgeois had a retrospective at the Guggenheim. Mm. And I was like walking around and and saw that um, one of her prints that was on some of the paper that I had made was hanging up in there. And that was a pretty cool like feeling. Yeah, um, I would say so. <laughs> it's interesting. A lot of paper makers are actually really skilled bakers. Interesting. Well, I guess, yeah, you have to be very diligent in what you do and how you do it and how much you use and all that different stuff. So it does, I could see the correlation. Yeah, it definitely, it, it's like the way you manipulate materials, like a wet sheet of paper, handmade, freshly pressed paper is a lot like working with like pie dough. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've, I've never thought about that, but it does make sense. So the, the jump then to leave a, a kitchen for in a restaurant that wasn't yours to country bird, how tough was that decision? Did you wrestle with it for a while? Was it always it, in the back of your mind? Kind of how did that come to be? Well, it was really tough. And I, yeah, I thought about it for a long time. Um, I loved working for Lisa. Um, I mean, that's like the only kitchen that I was, you know, I, when I moved back, I was like, I'm never working in another kitchen again. I was mm. actively like trying to find jobs in like the art scene here. And, um, I, I started working, um, I started teaching for global gardens and I did that kind of at the same time as I was, uh, working at living kitchen. Um, but, uh, just being out at the farm was so special and it didn't feel like, you know, like a real restaurant. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it was a really hard decision. Um, when we had our off season at the farm, when we were closed, um, I started teaching workshops um, to kind of like occupy my time, make a little extra cash, um, share something that I really love doing with people who are excited to learn because people would come out to the farm. Um, Lisa wanted to incorporate a, a bread course. And so the menu there changes entirely, uh, the tasting menu every other week, every two weeks. And then sometimes a menu would only stay on for one week. So sometimes it's changing mm. every week, which is hard, but it's also like creatively um, really stimulating and challenging uh, in a fun way. Um, and so I got to make these like really crazy breads uh, every other week, something new, and people really responded to it. Um, and they would always ask, where can I buy this bread? And, you know, I would say, well, we're not really set up for that, but I can teach you how to make bread. <laughs> and yeah. so um, the workshops kind of took off uh, from there during the off seasons. And then um, uh, Lisa was building farm bar out and then the pandemic hit and I kind of pivoted from being out at the farm to kind of helping, uh, being part of the team that helped to open Farm Bar. And so um, ended up spending more time in Tulsa. And it was great. Lisa let me use a uh, Farm Bar Kitchen to teach workshops from. Um, oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. On like yeah. on Sundays, once a, typically like once a month, I was doing like a workshop there. It was really nice. Um, and I had kind of had like aspirations of wanting to kind of um, do my own thing uh, and 
you know, some ideas of, you know, a couple of years from now, like maybe I would mm -hmm. be out on my own. And I was starting um, a bread club from my house, which was going to be a once a month bread uh, porch pickup where people could buy my bread uh, from my home. Um, and so I had just started doing that. And then the fire happened um, oh, at, Bur right, at Burn right. Hill. Yeah. And um, it, you know, it took it took us out for uh, we didn't know how long it was going to be, but ended up I think being maybe six months is how long they were closed. It was a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when it first happened and, um, you know, a lot of kind of interesting things happened from that, you know, out of that is, is when Lisa and Linda, uh, came up with El Seme, uh, the Italian oh, restaurant. Right. 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 Yeah, that was the that exact was, time, wasn't it? Yeah. That was spurred from the need to kind of like, find a, a place, you know, to keep the team going. Um, and then the farm kind of opened back up to accommodate some of the, the staff. Um, and I had kind of pivoted um, through a lot with them. I had pivoted through COVID and opening farm bar. And I just kind of felt like I didn't have another pivot, like in That's me. That's fair, yeah. Um, yeah. And I had just talked to a friend of mine that I used to work with at the paper studio. And she was saying that they were like super backed up on projects. And so, um, I, they hired me just as a contractor to, uh, go work for a month in the paper studio. And it was pretty fun. I was like, I, I'm just going to see if I still got it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and Dust so, off the old skills. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was really fun. Uh, she had a spare room and, um, I just like and that was went, back in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, okay. uh, yeah, in Brook in Brooklyn. Um, and so I uh, just kind of like left and um, wanted to kind of like clear my head a little bit and kind of get out of my, you know, space and and just kind of think about things and and make a decision when I got back, basically sure. because. At that point, you know, we thought maybe we'd be closed at the far at farm bar for maybe a month. Um, because we didn't know the extent of like repairs um after uh, smoke damage and sure, sure. and waiting waiting for the insurance and everything. It just took so long. So um I kind of once I got back, um I kind of felt like maybe it was time for me to be on my own. Um, and it was super scary. Uh, yeah. And right about the same time, um, somebody that follows me on Instagram sent me a DM of this bread oven. And they said, do you know anybody who might be interested in this oven? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me <laughs> yeah <laughs> turns out this oven is in Bartlesville um of all places this like Italian like really really fancy wow. a deck yeah. oven a uh, steam injection um and so she uh is such a wonderful human her name's Annie Saltzman she has uh three kids and a cake uh the eatery in Bartlesville okay. if you've been there I've um, heard of it I haven't been she they don't really do bread so uh there was a a restaurant that closed and um a guy who his family owns barbecue spots they bought out this entire like restaurant that had been i think it was maybe a sports bar at the time it was a old glass factory oh, that wow. was like um renovated it was beautiful and the guy bought all this amazing equipment um, but anyway, when this guy bought the whole building with all the contents inside, he didn't know what to do with this oven and contacted her. And so she contacted me. And, um, so anyway, I was just like, well, this is a sign. <laughs> um, yeah, seriously. What do you think it was about that 
that trip back, that contract work in Brooklyn that spurred you on and kind of helped you make that decision that it was time to, to go on your own? Is you think there's think, anything about that just, in particular? I think having a bit of time away to mm. just kind of like disengage um, and to kind of try and picture like where I saw myself. Um, I think at the time I was like, well, I've been at this for a while and, you know, it's, it's time to, um, it's, it's maybe time to, uh, try something new, um, get out of my comfort zone, challenge myself. Um, I think I also realized being there that like, it was nice to go back, but I didn't want to live there again. Sure. Sure. Um, although like, I don't know, sometimes in my, on a bad day when I'm really tired, I'm like, man. <laughs> yeah. You, you second guess that thought. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That totally. Be nice. totally. Yeah. Um, you know, my brain's always trying to work against me, but, um, it, it was just nice to kind of like not have to, not to feel the, any of the pressure, um, and really just focus on like the task at hand, which was like color matching, um, making really like consistent like sheets that were going to be used in this um, artist edition. And so mm -hmm. it was, I, I just kind of got to like turn my brain off, um, off and on in a way, <laughs> kind right, of right, right. like turn it on in a way that I hadn't used it in a while. And then also turn it off. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it, cause any job that you're going into day after day after a while, is just going to be a grind, no matter how yeah, much, it gets you love. Yeah, yeah, sure. no matter how much sure. you love it. And so it was nice to just kind of like, and my friends that I was working with, you know, they were like complaining about, you know, other, you know, situations in that organization yeah. that they work for. And I was kind of like, Oh, I get to be here and I don't have to be involved in that. Whereas like, if I worked here all the time, I would be, you know, <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You'd yeah. be complaining along with them. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And I think another kind of, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but I kind of had this idea in my head that I wanted to be kind of fully self-employed or like hmm. working for myself by the time that I was 40. Okay. And so, um, there's nothing silly about that. Huh. Yeah. So, so now I'm 41. <laughs> you made so it. I did it. <laughs> you made it. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. I wish I had a little confetti <laughs> popper or something. I could just shoot it off. That would be great. Um, so you, you get your space, Country Bird opens. I know the team kind of fluctuates. You've added people and all that different fun stuff, which we can talk about. But the reception from the community the lines out the door, all of that. I would oh imagine God. even in your wildest dreams of how quickly it would pick up and, and become popular and all this, you didn't expect that. Right. So I assume that just no. blown your mind. Yeah. That it blows my mind every time. And I yeah. just feel so lucky um, that people love, you know, they're willing to stand out in the cold in the rain in the heat and, um, yeah, it really, it blows my mind. I feel so grateful that people are willing to line up and wait, um, you know, for the stuff that we're making. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Um, when we first opened um, and, you know, our menu was much smaller. And I remember there was, you know, a day, one of the first like kind of days that we were open, um, there was a line like, we're like one or two people out the door. And I was uh -huh. like, Oh my gosh, that this is, this is great. Like I've made it. Yeah. I, yeah. And I, then I remember thinking like, wouldn't it be cool if we had a line that was like down the street? Um, because when I had taken that trip to New York, spent that month there, um, on the weekends, my friend and I would go explore bakeries. And so, mm. We um we went to this one called um Supermoon Bakehouse in um 
It was kind of in, I think it was near Chinatown. Okay. And, um, and it was a gray, rainy morning. And we got there 15 minutes before they opened. And there was a line like wrapping around the corner. That's and awesome. You, you got to stand in a line I instead of be the yeah, one. And say, yeah, I yeah. I experienced that, um, that, that anticipation, uh, uh -huh. the joy, the, the smells when you finally get inside and you get to see all the, I over ordered, I ordered so many pastries. I do that every weekend. So it, it's, it's all good. It's a challenge. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, you've waited and like the reward is there and you're like, well, I only came for a one croissant and maybe like croissant. something else. <laughs> yeah. And, but I'm going to leave with dessert and breakfast and dessert and breakfast and a baguette and who knows what else like it just, you might as well <laughs> i mean it, it yeah it just snowballs on you by the time yeah. you get to the register it's like okay well, <laughs> i'm gonna have to call some friends over because i had a lot of food <laughs> i was talking um, to someone this week who said that um they'll like send out a group text when they're in line and they're like, I'm at the bakery this morning. Does anybody want anything? And then people like text their orders. <laughs> I need to get in that text thread. That's yeah. awesome. But there's a, there's a certain community aspect in like, I've started to see a lot of the same people yes. that are in line. Cause I, I mean, I have, and I don't want to see now I'm going to just like, <laughs> I, I'm going to let everybody in on the secret and then it's no longer going to be the secret. But the earlier I go, the longer the line is. It's true. And, and you've started doing, I don't know if you do it every Saturday, but you'll release certain more lunchy things yeah. after 11. Yes. And so whether it's pizza or whatever it is. And so like that 1045 ish window mm -hmm. seems to be the sweet spot. Yeah. Seems to be you've the caught, sweet spot. Yeah. You've yeah. caught on. Yeah. We yeah. started doing, um, like lunch items around 11, uh, last summer. Um, Cause well, that last summer was our first summer. Uh, right. so we didn't really know, I didn't know if people were going to be willing to line up when it's so miserable out. Um, and so I thought, well, what if we, um, had some more lunch items as a way to bring people back in, um, or maybe not, you know, it's not necessarily the same, although sometimes it's people come in early and then they come back. Um, but oh, you've had two timers. Okay. So, yeah, it, it has, All right. it has happened. Um, and then, well, actually the best compliment it was, is when it's someone's first time they come in and they're like, oh, my friend told me about this place. And then they'll, they'll get maybe one or two things and then they leave. And they go to their car and they immediately try it. And then they're back in like five minutes. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> they're like, I just yeah. ate that thing in the car. I've got to get more. <laughs> I need more. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So the, that, that idea was really a way to like, also what are people wanting to eat in the summer? You know, like they're not, it's more, I know people are eat less in the summertime. And so it kind of felt like having more um, kind of lunchtime options to uh -huh. where people, people might want to come in knowing that we have something later. We're not sold out of it um, at that time. So, yeah. And it's that's good. something I've noticed too, that you've had to adjust is not just the depth of the menu, but the amount that you've made. Cause I remember early on, like if I didn't, and that's why I started coming early and I would just wait in line. Cause if I didn't, chances are the croissants would be gone just yeah. because that's like what everybody wanted. Right. And so yeah. it was probably, I would assume that was a pretty quick lesson to learn on the yeah. production side, you know, like, Oh crap, we gotta, we gotta ramp that one up. Cause yeah. I mean, it's, it's something, I guess it's like what live and learn, right? Like you didn't know how many people were going to show up, what they were going to order. So you just guesstimate on yeah. amount and then it's like, okay, we need to tweak that a little bit. Yeah. And it's constant every week is, is tweaking. We, we kind of have a better system down now, um, where we kind of have been tracking, like we have a spreadsheet and we track like every week, like how many of like which items sell. And so we're able to identify, you know, some patterns and fluctuations, um, and kind of adjust our numbers and not just kind of going into it like, well, I don't know how many, how many hand yeah. <laughs> cheese croissants do you think we should make? <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah. But yeah, it was definitely like, as soon as we had croissants, it was like the line got more intense. You know, yeah. um, people are, people love, I mean, people love croissants their croissants. Are amazing. Um, and yeah. ours are our sourdough. Um, so they are naturally leavened and we use a lot of, uh, stone milled whole grains in ours. And so mm. it really has like such good, like unique flavor it because, does. Yeah. because of that, um, those, you know, those things. And so it's yeah. kind of ruined me on other croissants to be totally honest. And that's not like, I'm not talking shit on anybody else that makes a croissant, but it is just such a unique flavor profile because of that. Like it's, I know when it's your croissant versus like yeah. who somebody else's, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's really cool. Yeah. And I, you know, I got really lucky. Um, Abby, uh, who I had known Abby, she was a baker at bake shop for a few years there. Um, and then they worked at, uh, Basque. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. And so, uh, Abby learned how to make croissants from, uh, Emily, who was one of the co-owners of Bake Shop. And so, uh, Abby was the first person that I hired and Abby actually, Abby's incredible. Abby is like the hardest worker I know. And Abby is just like the kindest human. And when I was first opening and I wasn't sure like when I would be able to afford to hire some, like, I just didn't know what that looked like. And yeah. Abby just kind of volunteered and, and Abby would come in whenever their shift ended at, at Basque and um, they would help me shape all the dough that was ready to be shaped. And she brought me a croissant um, one day and I was like, this is incredible. Um, you know, hopefully at someday we can make croissants and uh, you have the skill. And um, so, yeah, I very quickly was in a position to be able to hire Abby. And then it still took us a couple of months to get a sheeter, which is the piece of equipment that you need to laminate the croissants. Right. Um, because doing that by hand is fine if you're making like six croissants. <laughs> yeah, not at the scale. You, how yeah. many croissants on average are you making right now for a Saturday? Um, Like plain croissants? We're probably for, baking yeah. off like somewhere around like 65 or so like playing yeah that would take a while to do that by hand yeah <laughs> yeah it's um it's much faster when you have when you have the right equipment sure. um and the people who know how to do that thing so um so yeah it's just been it's been really fun uh being able to get into lamination that's awesome yeah. So what go a couple more questions and I'll let you get on with your Thursday. What goes into the creative process of making the menu each week? Because what I love is I don't know what was it? It was the Yuzu and Black Lime. Oh uh, yeah. Supreme, I think it was a, mm -hmm. a week or so ago. I mean, those flavor profiles, I would never I don't even know what black lime is, but I would have never thought to put like that together. So what goes into your creative process when you sit down and when do you make that menu? Um, so it's kind of like, what can we get our hands on? Um, and I've, for a long time, I've been kind of a purist about it. It's like, because I try and source as much locally as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we don't have anything strawberry on the menu right now because it's not strawberry season. Now, if I find a bag of like strawberries at the back of the freezer, you know, we, it may make a tiny comeback in something, sure. but we're not going to make strawberry pies right now because, you know, strawberries aren't in season. And right. so that was a fun um, challenge, uh, like working for Lisa at the farm. Like that was a really great way to uh, challenge myself to come up with unique combinations because Sometimes I feel like I, the more limited I am, the more creative I can be because I don't have yeah. to, yeah, it's like removing 
elements of the equation because sure. when everything's available to you, it's almost like harder. <laughs> a little overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had seen a bakery um, using black lime in something and I never really thought to like Google it or search for it. But then I was in Santa Fe um, the first week of January, we took a break and I went to visit some friends and just kind of like check out and relax for a little bit. And there was um, a little store that had a little like Italian market and they had interesting spices. And I just saw this jar of black lime powder and I was wow. like, oh, that's that's how they're doing that. So I grabbed a couple of jars of it and I had also recently come across one of our vendors, um, I had access to yuzu, which is also a flavor that I'd really just seen um, on online. I think I had like a yuzu, maybe like a yuzu mocktail or something at Oren um, a couple of years ago, but I, I hadn't really, it's just not something, you know, that I'd really had access to. And so of course I want to buy like the exciting ingredients and of course. Um, yeah. uh, it's kind of um, the black lime and the yuzu are both citrusy. Um, the yuzu is a little bit softer and more floral and the black lime is almost a little bit like smoky in a way. Mm. Um, and so it kind of made sense to pair them together, but Usually I'm trying to balance, like, kind of try and hit the, all the notes of, like, um, something acidic, something sweet, sure, uh, sure. something earthy, something nutty. Um, it's a, once you understand, like, the lexicon, then you can kind of plug different things in. Yeah. What like, is black lime? Is it? like charred grilled smoked lime or what what is so it's, it it's a dehydrated lime so it's like dried in the sun until it's just like black and then they grind it up and turn it into a powder um and it's really good we're just using it in like sweet applications but um the the producer also listed it as a great seasoning for like um rubs on meats that's what i was just thinking yeah 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 yeah. We also wow. like to use sumac a lot, which is, yeah. um, it's not in the citrus family. Uh, it's a little like a red berry and it actually grows wild here in Oklahoma. Um, but it does have, uh, an incredible citrus, like tangy flavor. Mm -hmm. That is a fun way to you to get like a citrus flavor when you're not wanting to add anything liquid to something like if you wanted to have kind of a lemony flavor but you don't want lemon juice you can use like sumac or black lime interesting yeah i don't know if you know this but heirloom uh jake miller goes out and forages sumac for a beer every year and yeah he, yeah he brews it into a beer yeah yeah they do some really cool stuff over there they do they do yeah. with the dandelions and yeah just every, i mean it's yeah they're they're ahead of the game when it comes to locally sourced just like not even things you would consider to put in beer like exactly yeah they're they're Super little, creative and yeah. they they do so much for the community too like i'm so glad they that do. that spot exists yeah they're doing really good stuff and i'm excited uh john pierce is coming on on monday to give us the lowdown on the coffee at heirloom this yeah. month, which then i think week after next and Super so that'll exciting. be yeah that'll be fun it's nice to have a different coffee option that's open at 7 a.m other than starbucks and right you know whatever, if you have to get coffee early. Yep. Um, all right. So a couple more questions. Uh, let's talk about the collaboration you're doing Saturday because Bradley is one of my favorite people. Uh, he's been on the podcast before. What led to that and what is that collaboration? Can you pull back the the curtain a little bit? Sure. I'm not sure how much there is to, <laughs> to pull back. Um, fair, fair. Basically just um, Bradley, like I've always admired Bradley. We've been kind of Instagram friends and, you know, we run in the same, like we, you know, both in the Tulsa food scene. Um, we've never really like worked together before, but um, he just kind of sent me an Instagram message a couple weeks ago. Um, 
And I don't know if it was because I made a soup post or not, because, you know, oh, Bradley, Bradley he's the soup master. Soup. Yeah. yeah. I, it was, this is my not claim to fame, but this is one of my proudest text messages I've received. Um, so he, I don't remember when this was, this was probably a couple of years ago. It might've been during COVID actually. I don't, I don't know, but he would make soups and he would have, there was a text thread that I somehow got on that was like, Hey, I'm making soup. Let me know if you guys want any and I'll put aside a deli for you and it'll be like 10 bucks or like whatever it was. Right. And so, I mean, he and I had been friends and became closer friends through all of that. And then seeing him at uh, actually at heirloom a lot um, and just around. And so now the other day, or it was probably a couple of weeks ago now, he texts me uh, that he had made soup and had some for me. I could swing by and pick it up whenever. And then he told me, he's like, every time I make soup, you're the first person I think of. So I just text you that I make soup. And I'm like, I have made it. Like, this is, I, I am a made man now. This is great. <laughs> you're like his soup ICE. Like, in case uh, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I have extra soup. Text John. It's just because I'm never saying no. Like yeah. ever because his soups are fantastic. Yeah. So is that what he's going to be? Is he going to be selling soup? Is that what he's doing? Oh so, yeah. Basically like we've, we've kind of texted about it a little bit. Um, he's, he just got back this afternoon, I think from a job and then yeah. he's like leaving again in a couple more, like he's just has this very small window that he's here. Um, so I basically, um, he reached out and was like, I would love to do a collaboration with you guys. Um, we settled on a date and then I was like listing off, uh, kind of ingredients that we had that I thought might be, um, interesting to him. And then he was, you know, just responded with like what kind of spoke to him. And, uh, we have these, um, different um like organic legumes are beans like pinto and black beans from a farm in kansas i think um, i saw them or do you sell them in the bag too like when you're waiting in line over there um I don't or the, is that a different those, company those are yeah those are rancho gordo and those right, right, they're right. based out of california and their okay. stuff is incredible um and he may who knows when he he is coming in tomorrow and so when he uh when he gets there he may he may choose some of those beans instead. I'm not, you know, I basically is like, whatever you want to use, you can use. Gotcha. Um, so some, some sort of like brothy bean. Um, and then we have like this really beautiful um, Hopi blue cornmeal that we got from Barton Springs mill that is in um, it's outside of Austin, Texas. And it's this beautiful, like, vibrant blue really sweet cornmeal mm. um and so I, I told him that you know we had that and we have all the this array of flowers that he can use and so he really wanted to do kind of like a beans and cornbread Ooh. um and we yeah. also we have our our homemade buttermilk because we're we're making butter in-house from um red ridge creamery so we just have like gallons and gallons of um, homemade buttermilk kicking around that we love to use to bake with. And so I would imagine that this corn cornbread's going to be pretty out of this world. Yeah, that's, I am definitely going to come pick up some of that. That's yeah. going to be fantastic. <laughs> um, all right. Last question is kind of a big picture question, but now that, you know, you're, you're there. You, I don't know if you ever really, I mean, I own a business too. I don't know if you ever feel like you've made it quote unquote, but the popularity's there, you know, people are showing up and showing up in droves. Do you have a, have you let yourself think of whatever chapter two might look like? Is it a different location? Is it expanding the current location? What, if anything, do you have planned for, for whatever phase two might be? Yeah. I mean, we, we have already outgrown that space. <laughs> um, we, uh, we can't. And I don't know how much you can talk about it. I don't know if yeah. like there's like secret <laughs> things or whatever. So yeah, that might, might be a hard question to answer. I might have yeah. more to share this summer. I don't know. Oh, um, there it is. Okay. <laughs> no, a teaser. I, I like it, it. It's, it's hard because you don't want to like, I don't want to 
somehow ruin the thing. Yes. Don't let I'm me be the person that helped you do that. Yeah. No, I just like. Or you, you mean know, by moving, like growing too fast or like yeah, expand? Yeah. 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 I yeah. got you. I thought you meant by what you were about to say. I was like, no, yeah. then don't say it. Um, no, I get that. Yeah. That is a real fear too. Cause like, yeah. What if you build something bigger in a different location and then people stop coming for whatever reason, right? Like, it's, yeah. 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 But I think like, Ever since the beginning, I thought that people would stop coming and mm. they haven't stopped coming. <laughs> that's probably yeah. a healthy mindset to an extent, though, because you don't want to take it for granted. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. It also means I'm I'm not I'm still blown away every Saturday right. whenever, you know, I see people coming half an hour before we open and it's, you know, like free, literally like. 19 degrees outside and they're standing there. And so, yeah, I do not take it for granted at all. Um, but yeah, you know, also, I want to be careful because, you know, to a certain extent, more doesn't mean like better or That's a great point too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or more, more. And also more doesn't mean more. So like, how do you find the yeah. balance? And it just, That's it's, a good it's point. like, you have to have the magical um, recipe of like the right people on your team, the right space, the right um, equipment, the right product. It's it's like mm -hmm. the stars just have to align, you know, yeah. for the magic to be there. And I feel like the magic is there and I want it to stay there. And so... <laughs> I feel like people can feel it like when they walk in, like they can feel that energy. And so, yeah, how to, how to grow in a sustainable way that, um, you know, retains yeah. that, those special things. Welcome to the life of a business owner. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the million dollar question right there. The one that's the hardest to answer. Um, you know, my initial thought, and I've always wanted to ask you this and I haven't, but I think I know the answer, but it's because of what you're dealing with. Because my initial thought would be, well, could you just open more days? But then the amount of time it takes to proof things and make things, but like, I don't even know if that's an option. Is that why you really only do one or two days a week because of just yeah. the labor intensiveness of yeah, getting everything ready? Yeah. So labor intensive and everything that we make is sourdough. And so everything is a three day process. Yeah, so that explains we, it. we start on Tuesday and um, we make the croissant dough. We also, that's when we're making a lot of stuff for um, like farm bar, living kitchen, like, you know, our wholesale uh, partners. And then, um, uh, on Wednesday, we are shaping, laminating. Uh, those croissants get frozen and they stay in the freezer until like Friday at the end of the day, we pull them out and they proof overnight and then we bake them off all on Saturday morning is like, um, it's like a chaotic, like ballet, like Adam yeah. and Courtney and I, and my mom helps us out. We're all kind of, I was going to say your mom's always there too. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's been, she's retired. So it, she, it's so great having her help. Um, she's like our to be your mom's boss. So yeah. It's, it's that's great. not hard at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love her. I can just imagine like if you come down on her and then the next time you're over there, like eating dinner, it's just like this. Oh, I could just imagine the tension or just the awkwardness. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, but she doesn't know. seem like the type of person that would be like that. So I, I think no, you, no, you gotta she get gets, she gets over it pretty fast. But yeah, it is a, it is a challenge. But um, I would imagine so. But uh, yeah. So basically, uh, it's just I mean, the timing, like you said, it makes sense. I mean, if it's a three day process, you start on Tuesday, you can't open before Friday. Yeah, unless you know? and so know, at that point, yeah, yeah. When we do Thursdays, it's it's um Wednesdays are really long mm, <laughs> we're yeah. all there like you know definitely more than eight hours um and then it just it makes the entire week pretty long but it's really nice because not everyone can come on Saturdays and so because there's a lot of people who just work every Saturday you know right. their schedule's different and so doing Thursdays has been a nice way to like 
get in um, people who can't come on Saturday or, you know, can't, especially when the weather gets nice and people are doing like their kids sports on Saturday mornings, yeah. um, then, yeah. it, you know, it's kind of helpful to, to have that day. But yeah, we're really working with the limitations of our um, refrigeration and, and our space and our bodies. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And I wonder, and you can just tell me to uh, not go down this road, but I would also think maybe part of that expansion or that chapter two or phase two, whatever we want to call it. Like, I wonder if it could help you to have like a offsite secondary kitchen, almost not even open to the public, but where a lot of that stuff can be like going on, not 24 seven, but constantly. And then you don't have to do everything from that one space, you know, something. Oh like yeah. 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 Um, I think there's a lot of different like configurations that it could, could look like. <laughs> sure. And I know you'll figure it out. You've, uh, you've hit a home run with, with country bird right now. So, okay. As I'll let you go, tell me what, uh, what else you have cooking. So obviously I'll come see you guys Saturday with Bradley. Yeah. Um, Bradley is going to be there. Um, we are going to start his serving his stuff at 11. Okay. So we wanted to kind of, um, it can, you know, it can be a little chaotic right there at the, the beginning. So yeah. we kind of wanted to be able to kind of get through that first push and then kind of like be able to focus on the fact that Bradley is going to be there and kind of make it more about him at that time. Um, and then that way too, like the people who, uh, who want to come like for that specifically, maybe don't want to stand in the, the first hour of the yeah. line. I have a um, feeling there's going to be a line though. I just yeah. have a feeling there's going to be a line. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's the plan for Saturday. Um, and, and then what then, about your classes or anything? Do you have some of those coming up? Yeah, actually <laughs> I need to schedule the next, I have, so I have two in February and one the first Sunday of March, and but they're all full already. Look so at that. I love I need that. To, <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to bake this time of year. So I love it. I love yeah, it. it's it feels it feels good. I love teaching the classes. Um, it's such a fun way to connect with people. And then um, I love it when I get messages like a month later, or sometimes I get messages like a year later that are saying like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I just wanted to, I've been meaning to thank you. Um, because ever since I took your class, I have never, I haven't bought store brought store bought bread once like oh, wow. for my family. And I feel so good knowing that like I'm feeding my kids this like nutritious, like healthy, like bread, like sustenance. Um, and so it's, it's really a fun way to connect with people. I will say I've gotten on this health kick lately and it's ba mainly because I did dry January, but it's, I think that's really going to shape my alcohol consumption moving forward. Just not that I will totally give it up, but I think I'm going to be very selective and when and yeah. why I drink, but just like more intentional. Yeah. It, but then also like, you know, I've, I've been doing cold plunges and workouts and saunas and all this different stuff and paying attention to what I'm eating. And th that goes a long way. Like what you just said, because if you really start reading labels, oh yeah, there's a lot of shit out there that we're putting in our bodies, whether yeah. intentionally, unintentionally. I, I would imagine majority of the time unintentionally because most people probably don't read labels. So yeah. being able to know, like when you're not just feeding yourself, but feeding your kids, feeding your spouse, feed, whoever it is, right? That it's all natural, or for the most part, natural, or at least somewhat organic, you know, local type ingredients and not words you can't pronounce yeah like that's that's huge it it really is and yeah you know labels are once you go down that rabbit hole it's hard to it's hard to yeah understand. i've realized that a I, lot of those I, yeah. ingredients aren't even really food no you know no. And now the, the companies, and this is a whole nother rabbit hole that we don't have to get down, but they're no longer like, there are now other phrases they can use instead of saying something was like genetically modified. 
So uh-huh. like you have to really understand <laughs> like right. what this ambiguous sentence that's just like tucked away in the bottom corner of a label, like what that is actually saying, you know, it's, yeah, it's like the whole thing. Yeah, like when they greenwash things and say that yeah. they use like, like natural flavor. Natural flavor. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That yeah. You don't want to eat that. <laughs> No natural flavoring. That's bad for you. <laughs> but when you see it and you don't know that you're like, Oh, it's natural. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. they just must've run out of room and they didn't want to list all the natural things that went into the natural flavor. It's like, no, it is so That's, scandalous. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It really is. I it agree. really is. And, and it's a whole different, I, it was an unintentional, probably lifestyle change to an extent. I mean, look, I know that when I go out to eat, like it's just what it is, right? You're going to get yeah. a lot of sodium. You're probably going to get a lot of probably going to get a lot of butter. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's it's what makes it delicious. Okay, yeah. let's just be honest. But you know, there's things you can do like knowing what you're putting into your food, and if you're cooking it at home, baking it at home, that's just a hundred times better than most things you can get on the shelf. You know, there is some local companies that sell on shelves and stuff like that, but even that, you know, the majority, like you're saying, you're, you're teaching people how to, in a way, live a healthier life. And that's pretty cool. Thanks. Yeah. I I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I'll let you go. I know uh, you had a busy couple of days and you have another couple busy days coming up. So tell Bradley, I said hello tomorrow, and then I will uh, see you guys at some point on Saturday. I'll probably come around 1045 again. Right on that sweet spot. <laughs> That sweet spot. And thank you for being the first guest on Tasting Room After Hours. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for accommodating my crazy fluctuating schedule. All right. You and I both. Who? who <laughs> life is just boring if you have an easy, normal schedule. You know that That's true. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll see you Saturday, and I'll see the rest of you that are watching on Monday for the Tasting Room live stream. See you, Kat. Thanks, John. See you Bye. Saturday. Bye.